Well, let's talk to John and get ready for week number four and get some of John's thoughts as we get ready to take uh, this week four bye week. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting uh, situations uh, as we get ready for the bye week. John, of course, covers the league nationally for today's pigskin.com, and we'll get some of his takes as uh, week four is here and starting with last night, John. Uh, you wrote about Adam Gaze earlier uh, for today's pigskin, and you watched that team last night. Look, I'm the first one to tell you that the Thursday night games are hideous, but they took it to a new level last night offensively. They're just completely inept, and I don't know that they were aware that A.J. Green was on the other team. Yeah, I mean, real quick before that, was, was Carson Wentz one of the key words? Because that's the only honor he was that he hasn't won this week. But uh, <laughs> it would be the Eagle. No, it was Hall all fame, Eagle but, Hall of uh, Famers. All, all, all Eagle Hall of Famers. Yeah, and he might be put in there by the end of next week uh, after the Eagles play and if they go 4-0. But, uh, yeah, getting to the Dolphins, I joked, I wrote about it. If Chris Sale was there, for, it started with the uniforms. He used to cut those, those uniforms to shreds uh, because they were hideous, the color rush uniforms. And then uh, somehow the Dolphins played even worse than they looked. And remember... You go back to the offseason, the Eagles wanted to be the head coach of this team. Make no mistake about it. That was choice number one. And then you can argue, uh, did they want Ben McAdoo? Maybe. Did they not? I, I don't think anybody in the Eagles organization thought he was going to get away from, from the New York Giants. So I'm not sure how serious that part was. But Doug Peterson was – definitely choice number two or three and hey it's very early very small sample size but that Dolphins team is an absolute mess and it doesn't look like Adam Gaze has the experience to be a head coach right now yeah uh, and, and last night John they uh, you know Byron Maxwell who was a total bust here I saw you tweet at one point I get it they're trying to discipline him but he didn't play one snap last night. I mean, so it shows you that they are trying. I mean, they are. He's trying to weed out the bad guys, right? I mean, that is that what he's coming up to right now where he's like, we're not going to be. I don't care if we're good. We're going to weed out the bad apples. Yeah, I mean, he, he benched Juwan James at the end of last week's game against Cleveland because he gave up that big sack uh, where Ryan Tannehill fumbled. And then the Browns couldn't take advantage because Cody Park had missed the field goal. So what he's trying to do is send a message and say, hey, look, if you're not going to perform, we're going to bench you. And I, I get it. I understand the message. I, I might even support it. But once A.J. Green has 111 receiving yards by, you know, four minutes gone in, in the second quarter, you might want to put an actual cornerback out on the field instead of a, a kid who used to play wide receiver at Michigan State and is trying to cover A.J. Green. So, hey, it's great. Byron has not played well. He didn't play well here last year, uh, but he's still uh, an NFL player. And after you made – after you sort of sent your message – Hey, then you got to put him back on the field and hope he, he took it and, and he utilizes it and he plays better. But you, you can't leave a kid out on E.J. Green who's barely played the position before. No, that was pretty bad last night. Uh, talking with John McMullen here, 97.3 ESPN.com. Today's pigskin.com, looking at uh, the week uh, in the NFL. But let's, uh, how about the Bengals last night? You know, because they got Bursa back last night. Eifert's on the way. They were one and two. Um, you know, I didn't realize. I know that Marvin Lewis has been there for a while. When they said during the broadcast last night, they had been there since 2003. I mean, I, I didn't know he was there that long. Is this kind of a make or break type of year for him, do you think? Well, you would think, but, you know, the Bengals believe in continuity, and you can look at it two ways. Nobody has coached more games uh, in NFL history with one team without winning a playoff game than Marvin Lewis. Uh, on the other hand, the Bengals have made the playoffs for five straight years, six out of seven, and that was that's a franchise record for five straight years. Uh, because that was not uh, an organization exactly steeped in a winning tradition. So 
he's turned things around. And when you look at the respect he has around the league, because look at his former coordinators, Mike Zimmer's a head coach in Minnesota, Jay Gruden's a head coach in Washington, uh, Hugh Jackson's the head coach in Cleveland. A lot of people think Ken Zampezi, who's the offensive coordinator now, he's going to be on a lot of short lists. So you can see the kind of respect the rest of the league has for his organization and how he's built things. So I think from their standpoint, they say, hey, yeah, we would have liked to have won uh, a couple of those playoff teams, but they look at it realistically and say, Andy Dalton got hurt last year. The year before, A.J. Green and, and Tyler Eifert were hurt when it got to the postseason. Uh, so they've had some really, really bad luck. And even though it's a bottom line business, I, I, I think Cincinnati's made the right decision because continuity means so much in this league. And as I said, people around the NFL have a ton of respect for their organization. And that tells you a lot. John, how about the quarterback on the other side of the game last night, Ryan Tannehill? Did the Dolphins make a mistake by giving him that big deal? Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, in, in South Florida, it's kind of the chicken and the egg thing because a lot of people want to blame their offensive line, which is terrible. And, and we've discussed that a lot about how bad the offensive line play is throughout the NFL. Miami's one of those teams with a really, really, really bad offensive line. But I think you can see it when you watch him play. The pocket presence just isn't there. And, and we see it with Carson Wentz. I joked about him being in the Eagles all, Hall of Fame. But he's got better pocket presence in three NFL games than Ryan Tannehill does after five years. So at, at some point, you got to say to yourself, it's, it's probably not going to happen. And I think well, Adam Gates is did mention, quickly realizing that. They did mention during the broadcast last night, too, which, look, I don't think um, that he's very good. I, I actually talked about this yesterday on the show, but five years, three coordinators. I, I think there's a big correlation that the fans don't understand sometimes that changing offensive coordinators every single year or every other year, it's not easy on these guys. No, and that's kind of, you're right, I agree with you, Mike, but that's kind of a chicken and egg thing, too, because a lot of people call Ryan Tannehill a coach killer. They look at it the other way. And, and the reason coaches are getting fired is because they can't do anything with Ryan Tannehill. So uh, it depends what side of the spectrum you're on. I, I will say this, though, if you're a good player, you're going to overcome that kind of thing. Uh, and, and usually there's a difference between successful teams. I, I just talked about how many assistants Cincinnati has lost. Uh, but they lose because they're successful. They lose them because they go on to get promotion. Obviously in Miami, guys are getting fired uh, almost uh, not quite at a Cleveland Browns level, but maybe second to the Cleveland Browns, and that's because they, they're always underachieving. And Ryan Tannehill's at, at the core of a lot of that. And I, I think, as I said, I think they're starting to realize, hey, this, this is just not the guy. Hey, uh, I got a text message last night. And I know we do talk about this from time to time, John. Uh, here is the text the exchange I have with a buddy of mine. And he said, um, he said, does anybody watch this and say, hey, I wish I had Tannehill? which is kind of what we just discussed. And I said, better question. If this game or any other Thursday night game wasn't on, would anybody care? I mean, that's how bad some of these Thursday night games are. That Miami team looked so unprepared last night. I mean, just completely didn't seem like they wanted to be there. Didn't seem like they had a game plan. I, I just, I know we talk about it from time to time, but that game last night was a clear indication that these Thursday night games are rough, man. Yeah, we have talked about it, and I agree with that. I'm not a big fan of the Thursday night game, and I don't think anybody is, other than uh, the people that cast the checks uh, for the TV rights, because the players don't like playing in them in a short week. The coaches don't like it because they don't have the proper time to prepare. Uh, and I, I, I don't think the fans like it all that much because of the entertainment value, and it just seems like 
uh, they're consistently bad games aesthetically. Uh, I mean, I, I think part of the thing last night was that Cincinnati's just a much better team than Miami. And they dominated for the most part. You take away the 74-yard touchdown, Miami did basically nothing all night offensively uh, from that point forward. Uh, and, and I think Cincinnati kind of pumped the brakes on people saying their run was done because they had a, a really tough schedule through the first three weeks. So I think they're still a better team than people think. And, and when Tyler Eifert does get back, hopefully next week, uh, they'll, they'll cure some of those red zone problems, yep. possibly. Uh, so that was, you know, there's one good team against one bad team, and the one bad team was really, really bad. They sure were. Um, I'd be perfectly okay if they got rid of the Thursday night game and played two Monday night games or got rid of the Thursday night game and went with the extra game uh, at 9.30 in the morning. I, I like that. I know that you can't do that all the time, but that Thursday night game, I, I could care. It doesn't bother. I didn't watch – I don't think I watched 10 minutes of that game last night. That's how bad the Dolphins were and disinterested I was in that game. And I, I think it's providing a disservice to some of these teams. That Miami team is just not prepared. And you know what else, John? The injury problems. I mean, Miami was missing like four guys because of injury. Yet you wonder if they could have played if it was Sunday. Yeah, and then from the safety perspective, a lot of people will tell you by trying to rush guys back during a, a short week, it, it makes them more susceptible to injury. So that's a lot of uh, the hip, hypocritical problems a lot of people throw at the NFL and say if you're really that concerned about player safety, you should really eliminate these Thursday games, except for Thanksgiving, because I think everyone is happy with that and the tradition of it. But uh, other than that, yeah, I mean, I've basically since day one, uh, I've agreed with you. I think they should eliminate the Thursday games. And you're right. If you could do other things to make up for that revenue, you could start uh, a game early as they're doing this week because they're in London uh, and get another television window. You could you can do the double header on Monday night, as you mentioned, which they do in week one now every season. Uh so there are some things you can do, but it's generally inertia with the NFL, and because the ratings are, are working, uh, they're not going to change. John, you brought up that London game, and I'm glad you did because uh, two things. One, that's a 9.30 start on Sunday, and we'll have that game on 97.3 ESPN. But is the London game uh, a symbol of where the league's going? Will that game continue to grow and expand? Do you think there'll be more games, maybe two a season, across the pond? Well, they have three now, so they have three each year. But uh, I think the ultimate goal – is to have an entire season in London. Not a team, but one game per week in, in London. Uh, I think that's the ultimate goal. And I think it's difficult because once it's not a, a special event anymore, uh, let's be honest, I've always said, this is not a game that translates well to other countries because they haven't grown up with it. And if you haven't grown up with it, Unlike, say, basketball or hockey, which are very popular on a worldwide basis, uh, if you haven't grown up with it, it's very, very difficult to understand. And the NFL has only made it more difficult uh, over the past decade, so with all the over-legislation. So, uh, as you can imagine, if you want to expand to Germany or or any other European country or China because everybody wants to get into the Chinese market because they think it's going to explode. Uh, and, and you can imagine a, a young fan in those countries trying to understand this game. It can't be easy. So I, I think it's a hurdle that the NFL is going to have a, a very difficult time overcoming. John McMullen with us. So, What's that thing with the China Football League that uh, Ron Jaworski's been a part of? I've seen some tweets and texts about that. Is uh, football in China on the future? Yeah, you just mentioned something about the Chinese market. That, that it's you know, Is that something that uh, I, I see the same thing you've seen, Pete, with mm -hmm. Jaws, with the Chinese Football League or something? like. Are you familiar with that, John? Yeah, Jaws is trying to bring arena football over there. And 
you know, like I said, everybody is trying to break into the Chinese market. Uh, UFC fighting, uh, WWE, everybody wants to break into that uh, market because there's so many uh, people and there's so much uh, promise for, for economic growth. Uh, and the NFL is no different. They've scheduled a game. I forget exactly off off the top of my head. They're going to be playing a game over there in a few years. Uh, and, yeah, they want to break into that market. There's no question about it. And from that standpoint, there's they're no different than anyone else. John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com. Uh, last night's game, we got the uh, game in London. There are other games that we want to take a look at that have some storylines around them, you know, um, Let's start off with the Des Bryant stuff. You know, you said that you don't think he's going to play. Looks like he's out this week. Uh, he says he could have handled things better. There's been a lot of controversy surrounding that situation. Uh, what's the read on Dallas and the whole Des Bryant thing? Because they've done, they seem like they've gone out of their way to try to protect this guy. Yeah, they have, and that's part of the problem. I, I, I think, you know, there's been whispers for a long time in Dallas that he's a guy that consistently misses team meetings. Uh, and by consistent, I'm not saying on a weekly basis, but it's happened uh, a number of times in the past. And uh, they just overlook it uh, because of his talent and his ability. And all of a sudden, you have an issue where he misses a team meeting and reportedly misses the MRI. Uh, and they don't diagnose the injury till. Uh, a day later than they should have, so it makes the organization look bad, and that's what Des was trying to talk about, and we'll see if he learns something from it. Uh, I doubt it because of the way that organization has handled him, um, and, and we'll see how it moves forward. If I'm Dallas, though, I'm more concerned about him as a player because forget about this season. He hasn't been the same player since he came back from the injury last season. Uh, the Jones fracture in his foot, which I think they kind of pushed him back on the field quicker than they should have. So uh, once you have these thoroughbred uh, players that uh, play skill position, whether it be wide receiver, cornerback, and they start having consistent leg problems, that could be a, a, a serious, serious problem. And that might be what you're seeing with Des Bryant. Hey, John, also with the Cowboys, you know, I, I said this when they drafted Gregory. Thought it was a waste, a bust. Uh, there's a reason he fell that far. And there's guys that they get drafted and, and they slip, you know, DGB slip because. But this guy just had knucklehead written all over him. Ten game hit, and uh, that's on top of the four game. He's not going to play all year. Do we see Randy Gregory in the league again? You never say never because he does have ta talent as a pass rusher. Uh, and I'm sure someone will give him another another opportunity. I'm sure Dallas will give him one more chance uh, to try to come back. But similar with Josh Gordon, and now we see again, he's not going to be back uh, when he's scheduled to be back. It, 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 the problem with players like that is it, it's not about feeling sorry for them. Uh, it's not about whether marijuana should be uh, legal from an NFL sense or not. If you're an organization and you can't count on a player to be there on Sundays, hey, that's all they're worried about. Uh, there's dozens, dozens uh, of, of players in this league that smoke marijuana and are able to to get past the testing because it's so easy to pass. If you show just a modicum of self-restraint, players like Gregory and Josh Gordon have never been able to do that and therefore their respective organizations can't count on them. And so from a football perspective, you can't plan uh, your season, your roster, your game plan uh, by relying on those players because you never know if they're going to be there. And, and at some point, it Josh looks like Cleveland has finally hit that point with Josh Gordon. At some point, you got to move on. Well, that was going to be my question to you, John. So the Josh Gordon news that he's headed to rehab, and what a sad story that is. Uh, then you have the whole Johnny Manziel issue. Is Cleveland snake bit? Are they making bad choices? Uh, or are, What's the problem with the Cleveland Browns that they can't seem to get out of their own way and they keep attracting these bad eggs? Well, I mean, yeah, they've made a lot of bad decisions, uh, I think. But with Josh Gordon, I, I can't really blame that on the Browns because he's had chance after chance after chance 
uh, and he hasn't taken advantage of it. So I guess if you want to go all up, all the way back to when they drafted him uh, and say they shouldn't have done it, uh, you can make that argument. But, hey, he had one all-pro season, so you got something out of him, at least from that perspective, from a football perspective. But, you know, to me, it's gone far beyond that with him. I mean, it's got nothing to do with football anymore. It's got a guy who's got some serious, serious issues. And uh, I know a lot of people were happy and excited he finally checked himself in the rehab. But, you know, you hate to be negative. But I look at the timing and the fact that he was supposed to be back on Monday and he was suspended all of last year. He was suspended the first four games. He never made this move before. Uh, in the back of my mind, I'm waiting for the, the news of the failed drug test because it's it's very, very, very strange timing. I'll just say that with Josh Gordon. Yeah, he was about ready to come back. Sad story, really is. Um, John, I got French onion soup here, so you gotta, <laughs> I got to go. Uh. <laughs> Hey, hey, take care, pal. Enjoy the games. We'll talk to you uh, stuff, on John. Monday. And uh, that's John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN. Uh, they brought me friends in the soup, Pete. I got to go.